Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. If you just watched my previous video, maybe you're watching it in a playlist, you'll be able to tell that I am filming this on the same day even though I'm releasing it a week later. My puppy is still here, my overhead fan is still going, my AC is still broken, and I'm wearing the same shirt. I don't change my outfit for you guys. I guess some booktubers do that, but I have like, I'm kind of doing like this minimalist wardrobe thing, so I have like four shirts, so maybe I'm not filming on the same day. And I just have four shirts. Now you won't be able to tell. Anyway, welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. You guys, you made it. This is my last video in the Iliad series. The final concept we will cover today is morality and divinity. If you want to find any of the other videos I've made about this, I will link the playlist and you can find it on my channel as well. Throughout the story, we meditate on what makes a life worth living, what makes a good life. And there's a strong argument to be made for gaining glory on the battlefield. It's the only way that mortals can gain immortality. It is the immortal reputation, your name being remembered forever. And it's ironic that the hero for whom this ideal can be most easily achieved, the strongest fighter, the son of a god, struggles with this idea the most because for him, the two options are laid out most explicitly. As I've talked about earlier in the Sillies, Achilles meditates on the idea of whether it would be better for him to abandon the fight and live out a long and peaceful life, but be lost to obscurity. His mother, Thetis, wants Achilles to have glory. She petitions for him to Zeus because of that very reason, and it's all too clear that she just wants him to be glorified as well. But there's no conflict for the gods because they don't have to contend with the alternative, with the idea of a limited life. So one, they're glorified by their divine nature, they're necessarily objects of worship, but they also don't have to contend with the idea of reputation. The gods are changeable because they have endless time in which to be changeable. So they will not be fixed by memory because they're ever present living out their own choices and decisions in their immortality. They don't have to worry about being forgotten either. They don't have to long for peace. If anything, they long for conflict in their endless lives, unlike humans. Well, although humans sometimes long for conflict, but humans do long for peace as well, which we don't really see the gods doing too much. So there's only one right answer from the perspective of the gods, glory. The Greeks also had this concept that a man was the plaything of the gods. It gets at this idea that we're subject to forces that we can't control. Some of them are outside of us like nature. So like Scamandros, both we have the river, the force of nature. We have the god who is named after the river, who is the god of the river, right? And then we also have the god in and of the river. So we literally see Achilles fighting with this god slash river being creature later on in the Iliad, right? Other forces are within us, seemingly parts of our own nature, but we can't quite control them. That is the idea of the god within and without, right? And so Helen is a really good example of this because she is so conflicted by her impulses. Yes, she's a very self-centered character. Every one of her speeches, it's always worthwhile to highlight and underline how many times she uses the word I or me. She's always talking about herself. But it's also clear that she really admires and respects Menelaus. She misses the respect and the self-respect that she had as his wife. And she respects Menelaus a lot more than she respects Paris. When Aphrodite has saved Paris from the duel with Menelaus back in book three, she, Aphrodite then goes to Helen to bring her to the bedchamber to sort of like reconcile these lovers together. And we see a bit of what it might have been like for Helen when she was first whisked away by Paris. She's attracted to him. She wants to go to him. She wants him in and of herself. But she also recognizes that this is sort of like the force of lust in her, the elemental essence of Aphrodite, if you will. And so that's the Aphrodite within, right? As well as this literal goddess taking on the appearance of another person and sort of persuading her with arguments to come this way. That's the goddess without. So she resists this force within and without her. So she has this impulse, she resists it, and then she tells um, Aphrodite, I forget who she comes in the form of, no, um, but Aphrodite commands. She's a goddess after all and far more powerful than Helen. So Helen goes. Who is she to deny a goddess, right? So is it Helen's fault? 
how, how much can she be held accountable for leaving her husband, for bringing war to the Trojans? I can understand why she walks around saying slut that I am. She is one partially by impulse, but partially by circumstance, right? And when I say that, I mean that within the context of the moral framework of the book, not in me making any judgment on, on a person. And like Achilles, she has a power and a reputation, the most beautiful woman in the world, the face that launched a thousand ships. Would it be better for her to live a peaceful and faithful life as a wife in obscurity? But who can spurn the gift of the gods? This is, they come together part and parcel, right? There's also this sense that the morals don't really have the right to judge the gods, even when Agamemnon goes back and forth believing to be favored by Zeus with a secure victory or abandoned by him, certain to die on the battlefield. He never gets angry with Zeus, just despairing. Mortals may not like the outcome, they may beseech the gods, contend with the gods, placate the gods, but they don't judge them. Um, they don't sort of like raise a fist in defiance to the gods. Even when Diomedes chases the gods and strikes them down, it's not out of rebellion or because of some like noble injunction that he feels Apollo is wrong or something like that. In fact, the moral question of how life should be and how the gods behave or how life should conform to their expectations never comes up. I think we think about this a lot in sort of like moral philosophy, right? So we have this question of if God exists, how could he be so cruel as to let tragedies happen in the world? And that has this sense of like casting judgment upon how God chooses reality should be. And that type of questioning just really doesn't come up with the Greeks. So which is better? Let's talk about Homer's conclusion. How does he articulate it in this book? To live a long life in obscurity or to die young and gain glory? There's really not a clear answer, especially if you take the perspective of uh, the Odyssey into consideration as well, which we'll talk to we'll talk about when we get there. Also, I got a great question from a friend of mine, EK Designer on Instagram, sort of comparing the Iliad and the Odyssey. EK, I haven't forgotten your question, but I'm going to answer it at the end of the Iliad or the Odyssey series so that we can look at both of these books side by side. Anyway, so the ambiguity to this answer of which is better really just reflects the Greeks' own conflict on this issue. It's like what they're trying to work out. Because on the one hand, they're actually pretty conservative. For example, they have like this really strong ideal of the oikos, the household. They believe that having a secure and stable home means having a strong society and country. Uh, so then, of course, that means that you have idealized roles for men and women. The idealized housewife at home, industrious, faithful. She's always sort of depicted um, sort of spinning and weaving and that sort of thing or preparing wool to be spun or woven. Likewise, we sort of idealize the leadership and the loyalty of the husband as well, and the economic prosperity as a result of him running his household well is his responsibility to bring to society. And yet they also recognize that you need a little bit of drama to make a good story, so unfaithful Helen gets a lot of attention and power. And by the end of the story, Achilles puts on his armor made by Hephaestus and charges into battle. But neither of them take any joy in these freedoms, in these bids for power and glory. Achilles is angry and sorrowing. Helen is ashamed and conflicted. For the Greeks, following the prescribed path may put you on the road to happiness, but even that can be destroyed because look at Odydi Odysseus, he's pretending madness to stay home with his family, right? Longing to be with his faithful wife in the Odyssey, traveling home to be with her, the ideal of Greek society, and he's still beset with troubles and just tragedy, right? So it seems that the role of the gods are to make men miserable. Or, taken from a more pragmatic perspective, the gods are there to explain the misery and tragedy of life as we experience it. If man were left to his own devices, not beset by these conflicting impulses within, um, impulses to do what is wrong, what is hurtful, then there's the sense that man might be able to figure it all out and achieve a peaceful and happy society. But there's also this sense that there's almost no point in thinking about it because that's just not how life is. That's not how human nature is. So we must contend with who we are as we are, which is to endlessly make mistakes and be led to make mistakes. Well, I mean, it is a tragedy. If you were looking for an uplifting last video, it's not gonna happen on the, this book, so. 
But that's all I have for you today. What do you think of the tragic worldview as expressed in the Iliad? Is there a silver lining that I'm missing? Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Thank you.